This is an especially uh, joyous day for me to see young folk who are, uh, you know, taking up the task of uh, being the next generation to do uh, nuclear power. You know, it's quite scary when you look at the uh, retirement rates and uh, all that, the, uh, uh, and the lack of people to replace them. Our existing fleet has served us extraordinarily well and very safely and very efficiently, but we all know we can do better with this next generation. Hopefully, the next generation also is an exciting new thing for folks like this, and, and I really thank you guys for, for coming out here and doing this. So, have at it. If you guys could introduce yourselves. So today, my group is going to be presenting on the engineering senior design project that we completed during this past academic year. So we studied the engineering design and also economics of a small modular molten salt breeder reactor with applications for a power plant. So the group consists of four undergraduate engineers from Calvin College. We actually graduated about a week and a half ago. And <laughs> Calvin College is a liberal arts school in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Christina Headley and I, Meredith Bridgeford, are chemical engineers, and Joel Smith and Thane Simmons are mechanical engineers. So today we're going to go over our project overview. We're going to go over the systems designs. We split that into three sections, the reactor fuel reprocessing and the power cycle. We'll, we also did an economic analysis. We'll give our conclusions and we'll have time for questions at the end. We started by defining our objective, which was to design a nuclear power plant that used a fission reactor and also used a thorium fuel cycle. And then we'd also do an economic analysis on that design to determine its ultimate feasibility. So getting into the more specific requirements of the project, we defined five problems with current technology, both nuclear reactors as well as fossil fuels and renewables that we wanted to mitigate with our design. So those were the negative environmental implications, the high cost, which would later be more, become more detailed in our economic analysis, the potential threats to human well-being, the low efficiency of both the fuels and the power cycles currently used, and the diminishing fuel reserves. So beginning with the reactor system, we started by defining our size. We chose a 200 megawatt electrical output and we went with a smaller design because that would have a smaller capital cost, which would mean it's less risky for investors. It's also capable, capable of being modular, which means that you can add more of them together to fit the grid size. We then looked into several different types of reactors, from current commercial reactors to generation four designs. And from the five criteria that we mentioned earlier, we selected the molten salt breeder reactor. For the reactor design, it was beyond our scope to actually develop our own core design. So we did a lot of reading of the Oak Ridge reports for the MSBRs and scaled from their 1,000 megawatt outputs to our 200 megawatt output. So summarizing the Oak Ridge report, the materials that they used for the moderator, because it is a moderated reactor, is graphite. Then we had different salts. So the coolant salt itself was flyb. And then the fuel that was dissolved in that salt is uranium and thorium tetrafluoride. They used Hastelloy N for the piping and vessel materials, which is a nickel molybdenum alloy, which does increase the cost of the plant, but is required for the temperature and the corrosion resistance. Oak Ridge published two different reports, the single fluid and the two fluid designs. 
in the single fluid design, the uranium and thorium were both dissolved in the same salt, but in the two fluid, there was one salt with uranium, one salt with thorium that were separated by a graphite shield. So the two fluid made the reprocessing side easier, but it also made the design of the reactor core itself more complex and then required more uh, replacement of, of that. So we went forward with the single fluid design. And then in order to determine the cost of the reactor system, we needed to size our reactor. So we scaled the fission region, which is section B on this diagram, and kept the thicknesses of the rest of the sections the same so that they would prevent the same amount of neutron leakage. So by those calculations, we had a total volume for the vessel of 2,200 cubic feet, which including the containment is 14 feet in diameter and 14 feet high. Now I'll pass it on to Christina for the fuel reprocessing. As many of you know, fuel reprocessing, the objective is to remove the feed poisons and fission products from the fuel. So the reason we do this is because the fission products will absorb a neutron and this absorption of a neutron will slow down the propagation of the reaction and thus decrease the performance of the reactor. And we want to, of course, maintain the highest performance we can. So furthermore, we're going to look at three specific areas. First, the floor meter. Then we're going to look at the extractor here and the, this extractor. So looking at the fluorinator, first of all, this is the salt coming from the reactor. The three main components that we're going to look at is uranium, thorium, and the fission products. The fluorinator and the rest of the system is operated at about 550 to 600 C and at 1 ATM. So what happens, the salt comes into the fluorinator and fluorine gas is bubbled through the salt. It reacts with, the fluorine gas reacts with the salt in particular the uranium in the salt and creates uranium hexafluoride. This uranium hexafluoride, about 95% of it comes off as gas and the remaining comes out of the fluorinator with the thorium and the fission products dissolved in the salt. Now following the stream with the thorium and the fission products, we'll go to the first extractor. This extractor is a liquid-liquid extractor, meaning we have two liquid streams coming into contact with each other. Uh, the, the way it works is that the uranium and some of the fission products are more soluble in the bismuth stream than in the salt stream, so they will be transferred when they contact. So um, for our process, we have the uranium and some of the fission products, mainly proactinium, will be dissolved into the bismuth and go on to further reprocessing. And the remaining stream coming out as the raffinate will be the thorium and the remaining fission products. This will go on to a second extractor where we'll remove the remaining fission products. Once again, this is a liquid-liquid extractor. We have bismuth lithium coming in as the solvent. And then the fission products will dissolve almost completely from the fuel salt. And then they'll be completely extracted from the dissolved salt, as we see here. And then coming out of the extractor as the raffinate, we just have the processed salt, which only contains the thorium with all the fission products removed. Then that stream will go on and add, you'll re-add the uranium tetrafluoride, and then that will re-enter the reactor. All right. Now we're going to do the power cycle. I'm sure all of you know, in order to actually produce the electricity from the reactor, you need to extract the heat and use a thermal cycle. So our research for this part of the project began with looking at different types of working fluids um, in order to perform this process. We looked specifically at supercritical CO2, steam, and helium, and ultimately decided to use supercritical CO2 due to its increased thermal efficiency and lower co overall cost for components. Um, from there, we looked at different types of systems currently using this working fluid and found a system from Sandia National Laboratories that you can see here in this diagram. Um, 
And given this model, we were able to perform an uh, optimization of the overall system. In order to account for the corrosivity of supercritical CO2, we did research on different materials and found a material called Inkaloy H, which is a nickel iron chromium alloy. So after deciding on what system we are going to use, we, uh, given our, math or our economic models, uh, found which uh, variables we wanted to increase and de decrease in order to uh, optimize for a reduced cost. So solving the whole mathematical model in ease, um, we were able to define uh, power output for our smaller turbine at 80 megawatts of electro uh, electrical power, 200 megawatts from our large turbine, an outlet reactor temperature at 675 degrees Celsius, and reactor power outlet, a reactor outlet pressure at 1.9 megapascals. Using these values, we were able to uh, then use a program called Flonex, which allowed us to do sizing of each of the elements in our system, starting specifically with these variables. So beginning with the turbines here, as well as the reactor, which I left out of a green box, oh well, um, we took the set power outs and outlet pressures and uh, set those values and ran uh, several iterations using this program changing what's called the discharge coefficient and flow admittance uh, variables within each of those elements using these equations that they're governed by to find what those values need to be set at so that we can then set those values and begin optimizing the whole system or uh, solving for the entire system. From there we went to design the heat exchanger here. Um, we have two heat recovery systems and those systems were solved by setting the mass flow rate which was solved after finding these values from the turbines and reactor mass flow rate and changing the uh, discharge coefficients and heat transfer coefficients of each one of these uh, heat recovery systems. Once those were solved after several thousand iterations of those, we were able to set those values and then continue solving uh, by solving for the compressor uh, variables by setting the mass flow rates coming out of these heat exchangers and the outlet temperatures and we were able to set uh, a sweep volume of each compressor, uh, that being the volume within each of the compressors at any given time and the intercooling temperatures. After this entire uh, sizing analysis, we were able to determine the total power out of our system after doing another several thousand iterations through Flonex, um, gave uh, 200 megawatts of electrical power um, and requires 480 uh, thermal megawatts of power from our reactor, giving us a 41% thermal efficiency, a uh, system mass flow rate of roughly 2,800 kilograms per second. Uh, also solving the system, we were able to determine a maximum pressure, and given that and the uh, yield strength of our material, we were able to determine a, maximum, a minimum pipe thickness of 40 millimeters um, in order to protect the entire system. We'll now go on to the economic analysis. So uh, we assumed a 30-year uh, loan with a 12% interest rate and a 95% capacity factor, or excuse me, 90% capacity factor for calculating electricity costs. For the reactor, the largest upfront capital cost was buying all the salt. Um, and again, for the operating cost, the salt is also a large cost because in FLY we need the enriched lithium, and that goes for around $10,000 per kilogram right now. So not, not exactly cheap. <clears throat> so uh, for the reactor, we're looking at $240 million up front. Um, that annualizes to $39 million. And um, counting for the annualized capital cost plus the operating cost, we're looking at $93 million per year. <clears throat> as far as the fuel reprocessing goes, um, the largest costs were the protactinium decay, decay tank and the two extractors that we looked at. Um, and so the, the fuel reprocessing side, uh, the equipment cost $2.2 .2 million. Um, and in one of the reports that we looked at, it suggested having a fluorination, um, or a, a fluorine reprocessing uh, facility attached to the plant. Because as we can see in the annual operating cost, the fluorine gas is by far the most expensive materials cost, just because there's so much of it and it's running all the time. So that's the, the $12.8 million accounts for the equipment costs as well as the fluorine reprocessing. And that uh, the fuel reprocessing comes out to be $3 million um, per year. 
And as far as the thermal cycle goes, uh, the purchase equipment cost was $33 million, um, and then accounting for the walls and piping and everything else, we estimated that it would cost $209 million, and that annualizes to $34 million. And the most expensive parts were the heat exchangers and one of the compressors. So uh, for everyone keeping track back home, uh, here are the final numbers. Um, the, this comes out to be $148 million annualized per year. And with a 90% capacity factor, we're looking at 8.7 cents per kilowatt hour um, during the first 30 years of operation. That's our break even point. Um, so as of right now, that's cheaper than what most uh, people have to pay for their electricity, which it looks to be an economically viable venture as of right now. So that's a plus. Is it cheaper than coal? Uh, not necessarily. So uh, to finish this off, uh, some acknowledgments. We'd like to thank Sigvald Berg. He was our primary consultant during this uh, project, and he's worked at U.S. Navy Unistar Nuclear Energy, so he has um, uh, some background in the nuclear field. And also Professor Van Antwerp and Pro Professor Hewn at Calvin College. Um, they were great help. And also Professor Skutnik and Shvala at the University of Tennessee. They provided us with some resources earlier on. And also Stephen Theron, who was a huge help for us in getting our Flonex model to work. And also I'd like to thank John Kutch for allowing us uh, the opportunity for speaking here. And with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Man, 12%, that's like my first home loan, man. <laughs> here, yeah. why don't you guys hold on to the mic? I'm curious on your economic costs. Uh, did you find they were li linear? And if not, in terms of choosing the 200 megawatts, uh, was it linear? Was there a curve? Was there some sweet spot for the most economical plant that may have been different than what you picked? Um, as far as like overall plant size, um, not really. We originally picked it out at the beginning because it was just one variable that we needed to eliminate. And also we figured that with it being smaller, we'd be able to hopefully ship the components rather than trying to build them on site. So we decided pretty early on on that. Does this design that you created essentially represent what would be considered a state of the art design given today's technology, materials, engineering, utilization? for your equipment and then uh, the overall general design? I would like to say yes, but I am not sure I'm qualified to give that answer. Um, again, we really were just a group of enthusiastic undergraduate students that looked at a lot of different sources of information. Um, so to say that our design is state of the art um, is kind of a long shot in the sense of uh, there's probably a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, however, um, it's, yeah, it's to the best. The cost, the operating cost, you had a significant portion of your operating cost was the salt. I'm curious, why are you adding salt? Where, where, where's the salt going? When did you lose it? The reactor economics, a large portion of the annual cost was the salt. And that was for the makeup salt that was included in the Oak Ridge report. I think it might, might, might have slipped to zero. <laughs> well, it, it also included the lithium. It was, so that was being cycled out. So that, that was why it was so much more expensive. On your uh, pipe wall thickness calculation, you had like 40 millimeters thick on the pipe diameter. What, what material were you using? Like what grade of steel or yeah. what were you using? Um, through our research, we found that the yield strength of uh, Inkle H uh, was around 544 megapascals operating at 650 degrees C um, over a 12,000 hour period. Um, that uh, provided us with a very rough estimate for the pipe thickness. We did want to do that calculation in order to provide some means that we accounted for the safety. Um, I'm sure you can't just put any pipe diameter on a thermal system and expect for the pipes not to burst. So um, that's probably a very, very, very conservative estimate for pipe thickness. Um, that's something that would be optimized in the future with better resource and data. Also 12,000 hours isn't very long, so we didn't have good data for that. What was your payback period on your capital expense and what was the interest uh, assumption? Yeah, so um, we assumed a 30-year loan, so with the 8.7 cents per kilowatt hour, that would be paid over that 30 years, and we assumed a 12% interest rate. Um, so if we were selling at 11 cents, it would be quicker, I guess. Um, I didn't look at that payback year time specifically. 
Very good.